Oh, okay. <laughs> we'll save that. I'll save that again. Okay. It is now 7.03, and I am reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, December 18, 2023. Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Donahue. Here. Ms. Deming. Present. Mr. Rising. Here. Ms. Gintz. Here. And Mr. Karubas. Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Gentz, will you lead us in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have four board salutes tonight. Ms. Dumming. District 204, District 204 student awarded the Patriot Penn Scholarship. The board salutes Samarth Argrawal, a seventh grader at Scullin Middle School, who won the Patriot's Penn Scholarship from VFW Post 3873. This year, 307 youth essays entries were submitted from nine schools. The essay contest encourages young minds to examine America's history by drafting an essay expressing their views based on the theme, How Are You Inspired by America? The veterans of foreign wars of the United States are dedicated to promoting patriotism and investing in our future generation. Congratulations, Samarth, on this outstanding achievement. Ms. Gantz. Wabonzi Valley Senior achieves rank of Eagle Scout. The board salutes Wabonzi Valley Senior Niels DeBrucker for achieving the rank of Eagle Scout, the highest advancement rank in scouting. Niels built new doors and repainted a shed for the Naperville congregation Beth Shalom for his Eagle Scout service project. Congratulations to Niels on achieving the prestigious rank of Eagle Scout. Mr. Rising. District 204 teachers win University of Chicago's Outstanding Educator Award. The board salutes Neko Valley teachers Chris Sabrinsky and Laura DeBezik for receiving the University of Chicago's Outstanding Educator Award. Students accepted into the class of 2027 were asked to nominate an educator whose guidance has helped them along the path forward intellectual growth. Hundreds of students recognize teachers who have positively impacted their lives. Congratulations, Chris and Laura, on this outstanding recognition. And then I have a last special one. Uh, Mr. Davenport, if you could stand up. Uh, Illinois Principals Association DuPage Region Middle School Principal of the Year. The board salutes Granger Middle School Principal Alan Davenport, who was named the Middle School Principal of the Year from DuPage Region of the Illinois Principals Association. The award recognizes middle school principals who have demonstrated a positive impact on their students and the learning community. Congratulations, Principal Davenport. <laughs> and, and I believe, uh, I believe Principal Stipp has an award for Mr. Davenport, if you wanna come up. I was going quick, just like in school. <laughs> yeah. Got to move fast here, yeah. Thank you, Board of Education, Dr. Talley, um, for giving me some time to speak. Um, I do not have the certificate. It's in the making because this happened a little quicker than I thought, but I wanted to jump on this salute. And uh, as membership chair of Illinois Principal Association of the DuPage Region that I serve, I was honored to be able to come here and uh, congratulate and recognize one of my colleagues who I've gotten to know these past 12 years. He's always a go-to person for me when uh, I want to vent or when I'm looking for some advice or um, just looking for some guidance. And I do want to just take a, a brief moment and share with you his nomination from one of his teachers, Elizabeth Mencila. Mencila. Um, I thought her words were specific to what I've known as Al and working with him for 12 years and what I hear from students and other staff that see him. She writes that Al's doing a great job as principal of Granger. He's approachable, 
and is well liked by, teachings, by the teaching staff, students, and parents and community members. He wants teachers and students to succeed. He is often in classrooms modeling lessons for teachers. He's in the hallways during all the passing periods. He makes the morning announcements fun, engaging for students every day at dismissal. Al can be found directing traffic out in front of the building. He is visible and liked by our community. He truly cares about the students. Having worked closely with him provide endless opportunities for our students. We have partnered with several community organiza organizations to create these opportunities. Al has built relationships with APS and brought STEM and engineering instructors into Granger to work with our students. This year, Al has worked to build a mentoring program with one of our feeder schools. That was specifically something that Al reached out to me to get some more insights with and uh, always thinking how to connect with all kids. One day a week, we take some of our at-risk students over to the feeder school to work with younger students. The kids eat breakfast together, do SEL activities and play games. We've also invited our feeder school students to participate in an after-school program. Our Granger students are paired with younger students and are working to complete a whole STEM project through this. He's very student-centered. He goes above and beyond and makes sure that all students succeed. The Granger team works so well together because Al has created a culture that all adults are valued. The small things he does for the teachers are so appreciated. He often acknowledges accomplishments at staff meetings, takes time to talk with staff, and writes staff endless amounts of thank you notes. One time, Al wrote me a personal note because he saw me sharing a lunch with a student. The work that Al does and all of us do as leaders, we never like to talk about it. We try to do it, constantly reflecting on it, and it gives me great honor to take a few minutes of this time to um, bring this work forward and recognize you. Uh, Al has uh, completed the application to be the DuPage Region nominee, and we hope that he will uh, move on to be the state nominee for Principal of the Year for Middle School. Congratulations, Al Davenport. I'm just going to take a moment to embarrass Al for a moment. So I was at the Jewel Oscar uh, the other day, and three of his students came up to me and they said, Are you Dr. Talley? I said, Yeah, I am. I said, What school do you go to? Granger. I said, Oh, do you like your, your principal? Yeah, we love him. He was doing uh, uh, handstands in the hallway the other day. <laughs> Um, on a more serious note, though, we had um, uh, uh, an emergency situation occurring recently because of an incident happening in the community, and we had to move students from Mattia to Granger, and every time we called Al, it was like, on it, got it, not a problem. I truly appreciate his can-do attitude. Every time I see him, uh, he is... I'm here for the kids, I can do this, we have it. And I just truly appreciate um, his positive attitude, his approach to things, and so I congratulate you tremendously, Al. Oh, it's such wonderful news to hear that um, accomplishment and wish you the best in the state level and. Um, if nothing else, we appreciate you greatly. So, um, all right, our next item is the student representative report by Rishlath Amsaraj from Matia Valley. This is, no, oh, there we go, okay. <laughs> First time. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rishwant Amsaraj, and I'm the executive board representative for Matia Valley High School. It's a pleasure for me to be here with you all today. It's a quick report today, so we'll get started with some general updates. 
We had over 300 families attend the academic planning night, which was hosted by our guidance department. A big thank you and congratulations to the guidance department for hosting and executing this important event. Hot chocolate with Marty was last Friday, and it was a great success. This is one of the traditions that Matia Valley students and staff look forward to each holiday season. Next up, fine arts. Our speech team has won three tournaments in a row. Great job, Mustangs. Coll um, sorry, Collage was beautiful, and we had over 700 students and more than a dozen staff members involved in this great event. Congratulations to our talented Mustangs and musicians. Last but not least, we have our athletics. Winter sports are weeks underway and are doing well. Most programs have participated in Thanksgiving tournaments or invites with more upcoming events in sight. Matia Valley was asked to host regional boys basketball this winter and we are excited about that opportunity. Our captain's council group was able to participate in Mayor World's suicide disputer training last week and we were thrilled to represent not only Matia Valley but District 204. A special thanks to Josh Robinson, Dave McDonald, and Eric Anarino on their work with Captain's, Captain's Council. The athletes and coaches are working hard and are gaining momentum as we head into the holidays. So many great things happening across the board, and this is just a snapshot of Matia Valley's success and potential. That's all for the December board report. Um, thanks for <laughs> listening. Stay safe, and as always, go, go Mustangs. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now it's time for public comment and 60 minutes is allowed. Um, what was that? Oh, okay. Um, each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups and as such, we ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Although this is not required, it is helpful for the board to know whether the comments and concerns we hear are being raised by residents, so we ask that you state if you live in the district and if you currently have children in our schools. We have one speaker tonight, uh, Courtney Phelps. Good evening, thank you for listening to me speak tonight. I'm speaking this, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, my name is Courtney Phelps, and I have a student in 204, and I am a resident of Naperville. I am speaking this evening to provide feedback regarding the facilities assessment and master plan. I'm a parent of a Kalashaw Elementary student. I've reviewed the plan for Kalashaw, and I have concerns. Kalashaw was built in the 90s, and the services provided today are very different than the services provided now. I see how the plan addresses the need for dedicated spaces for services like physical, occupational, and speech therapy, spaces for special education, and reading, math, and math intervention. However, in providing these spaces, at least three regular classrooms are taken. The need for these dedicated spaces is undeniable. Currently, these educators are providing these services in what used to be storage closets, many of which have no windows, and the climate in these spaces vary greatly due to the changes in weather, freezing in the winter, sweltering in September and May. Our stage is currently the only space that we have for storage. Currently, Kalashaw serves about 550 students in 25 classrooms. There are 20 to 25 students in each classroom. If three classrooms are used for other purposes, where are the roughly 75 students supposed to go? Approximately 13% of this, our school population. The district and this board have worked hard to keep class sizes low, and yet if this plan is implemented as we see it now for Kalashaw, class sizes will rise. The need for functional student spaces where students can receive special ed intervention therapy and therapies are great. However, doing this by increasing class sizes is not the answer. Therefore, I strongly encourage the board to consider an addition to Kalashaw. Kalashaw is lucky to have space to expand and by doing so, all of our students and educators will benefit. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. We now move to our consent agenda item and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. Members of the Board of Education, Indian Prairie Community, I need to start my comments with sad news. Quinn Felici, a kindergarten student at Graham Elementary School recently passed away. 
May Quinn's family know that we are saddened by the news and we send our support to their family. I ask that we take a moment of silence in honor of Quinn. Thank you. I want to start my comments by reminding our parents about the various parent academies we have had this year and will continue to have throughout the school year. In an effort to meet the needs of our parents, we have crafted some of these parent academies to happen virtually or in person or through video. At the beginning of the year, we held a parent academy on school safety and security. It was a video. Other academies include top 10 keys to help elementary school success, Two weeks ago, we did one on what is SEL. This week, we have one on social media and internet safety. The topics of these academies were created through a survey of the parents and asking them what they wanted. All of the academies may be found on our website where you can watch the videos. Future topics that will be covered when we return from break include managing peer relationships, how to advocate effectively for your child, and becoming a middle school parent, just to name a few topics. I want to thank our community for the yearly Winter Wish campaign. We were able to raise more than $15,000 with funds purchasing gift cards that were given to some of our families. We received donations from IPPC, Kiwanis, Mr. Nathan Gardner, Naperville Fire Department, Grace United Methodist Church, IPF Kids Essentials, and Mequa Valley High School Student Council. Additionally, Anderson Books Shop donated more than 680 books to middle school students. Our community always comes together in support of others, and that is what makes Indian Prairie great. I hope all of you have a wonderful winter break, and Ms. Donahue, I will turn it back to you. All right, I now need a uh, motion and a second for our consent agenda items D through I. Make a motion that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items D through I as presented. Any discussion? Michelle, will you call the roll? Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Gent? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Yes. And Ms. Deming? Aye. The motion passes. Next, we move to our action items. I need a motion and a second to approve the master facility plan as presented. I move that the Board of Education approve the master facility plan adoption as presented. Second. Okay. Good evening, members of the Board of Education. Tonight, I have with me Rick Dewar from Wine & Company, and we are recommending that the Board adopt our master facility plan. The plan's draft was initially presented at the November 20th Board of Education meeting after nearly a year of work involving district leadership, teachers, community members, and students. Since the draft presentation, we have further reviewed board and community feedback and will continue to refine the plan and our implementation strategies based on feedback. I want to thank the teams at White & Company, Alara Engineering, and Answer Advisory Services for their hard work and dedicated to our plan. The Master Facility Plan should be viewed as a long-range strategic document responding to district goals, our portrait of a graduate, and our strategic plan. The Master Plan is an outline of our intention and vision. Our focus of the Master Plan was to comprehensively address many aspects of our facilities. And tonight's plan addresses needs in safety and security, building infrastructure, and our educational alignment and programming. No work is explicitly being approved with tonight's adoption. As we begin to implement the plan, administration will bring specific projects to the board for approval. We will report back to the board regularly on the status of our progress. This will not be a static document, but will be a living document that continues to evolve as we complete work and further refine our, our goals and needs. I do want to emphasize that we have already began work on many items included in the plan. Work completed last summer and scheduled for the summer of 2024 include many projects that are identified in this plan as immediate needs. Even this evening, the board just approved a security camera upgrade for all district middle and elementary schools as part of the consent agenda. This project was also identified as a high priority need through our security assessment and we are excited to begin work on that improvement. Um, we may be able to get some people out there to start pulling cable this evening, but if not, we'll be beginning during winter break. 
Um, I do want to quickly highlight a few updates to the plan that we have made since the November 20th presentation, as well as some open items we are still examining. Um, first, at the elementary school, we have removed the maker space rooms from many of our elementary schools. Um, based on the review of community feedback and our current plans for STEM integration, we believe these spaces are not necessary to, to fully support our STEM needs. Uh, a lot of our STEM programming is able to be done in the core classroom. Uh, we've also utilized our LMC space for some of those needs as well. This will allow those rooms to be uh, designated as a special education support space and will allow some additional classroom space at all elementary schools. So on average, that brings it back to, or two classrooms um, to, to all our elementary schools. Uh, as mentioned at the November 20th presentation, we are confident the plan includes necessary square footage at the Neuqua Valley main campus to integrate all freshmen. Um, and while the total square footage is adequate, we are still evaluating uh, space needs for some specific special education and science programmings. Um, so one potential solution we are still evaluating would be a five to eight classroom addition at the back of the building. Uh, this is not reflected in the current plans, but will continue to be evaluated as we work through other needs at Neuqua Valley. Um, the plans also currently show a black box addition for Wabonzi Valley. That's an um, additional theater space. Uh, this space would util be utilized for a variety of theater and fine arts programming and provide parity with the other two high schools. Another alternative we are exploring and will continue to explore as we dive deeper into the plans for Wabonzi would include more immediate needs and, and more flexibility with the current auditorium space and then create more of a general forum room in that footprint of the current black box. In general, Wabonzi Valley will be transformed under this facility plan and will likely require several years to complete all the work. Uh, so the timing of very aspect, various aspects of that facility will be critical, not just to the plan at Wabonzi, but our ability to complete work throughout the district as well. Um, and we will be planning that work in a way to ensure we can support our future while also serving those current students. Administration has began to develop plans for funding and implementation of this plan, and we'll update the board on this work at the February Board of Education meeting. As previously mentioned, this is a long-range plan that will require many years to complete. Given the scope, we do expect several funding sources for tonight's projects, for tonight's uh, plan as adopted. Funding sources will include dedicated capital revenues, uh, expected operational efficiencies, energy efficiency and sustainability grants, and strategic spending of district reserves. The largest potential revenue source is the recapture of the current debt service levy, which will no longer be needed to pay district bonds after December 2026. The use of these proceeds will require community approval, and we've began the process to inform the community of our plan and intention. In summary, I'm excited to present our master facility plan for approval and believe this is an exciting step for the future of Indian Prairie. Uh, Rick and I are now available to answer any questions the board has. Mr. Rising, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah, so just uh, two statements and one question, <laughs> but I'll make them quick. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate again, as you had mentioned, Matt, at the beginning, just in the consent agenda, we passed security cameras for all the elementaries and all the middle schools, which is, at my count, it was either between 13 and 18 cameras per elementary school and 26 to 30 cameras in each of the middle schools. Uh, so further proving that security and safety is a, a primary focus for us and and we are spending just under $2 million on that, correct? That, that's correct. That is, um, that is a security camera system that uh, will provide full exterior as well as interior coverage for, for those schools, okay. correct? And then, um, you know, the, the Board of Education received uh, 119 pages of comments and feedback. Um, I know, I think all of us read all of those 120 pages of feedback from the community. Um, and that was evident in some of the classrooms, stuff that you discussed, especially at some of the elementary schools where we heard from a few more of the elementary schools than, than other elementary schools, correct? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Then uh, that was a response, again, both to the community feedback and then, um, I mean, even as we, I think, took a, took a step back uh, and, you know, looked at some of those plans a little further, I think that's, uh, that's the correct uh, Correct decision that we've made. Um, again, I think we were we were excited about the potential for maybe adding some some maker spaces in our um, buildings. Uh, that that's been a popular spot that at some of our comparable districts. But it does first, it doesn't align necessarily with how we're delivering that instruction right now. 
Um, and secondly, we, we do think, again, based on the feedback and, and even based on um, some discussions we've had as, as an administration, I think the, the better use of that space, again, is, is to build some of those resources, some supporting spaces, and then just ensure we have that flexibility for, for future classrooms. Sizes. And then I know, at the, I, I know I asked this at the November 20th meeting when we talked about more in detail the facility plan, but, and you kind of alluded to this today, I mean, this is a, a working document, a roadmap for, for the future for 10 plus or more years and how quickly we can accomplish some of these as far as the expedi expediency will depend on the funding that we can come up for a lot of these improvements, correct? That's correct, yes. Okay, thanks. Rishvan or Victoria, do you have any questions about the facility plan or comments? No? Okay, thank you. Ms. Dumming. Just a comment, very excited about the potential to see our uh, buildings take advantage of some of the new uh, ideas and processes and facilities that we've seen in some other uh, locations across uh, across the state and across the country. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to specifically look at uh, each specific school, and uh, I will I, I will be following up. Um, there's some I do have some questions, but won't won't uh, take up this time. But we'll be following up with you, Matt. Thanks so much. Great, Miss Gens. I do not have any questions, but I did want to reiterate because it is like. Mark read my mind. Um, I, I really do appreciate that safety and security is one of the first things we are addressing. And um, I hope that everyone does keep in mind that this is a very, you know, flexible plan and ever changing throughout the years. So keeping that in mind as, you know, they might see something come up that it could very likely, you know, end up changing, looking different or not happening. But thank you again for all of the work you guys did to get this started. Mr. Karubas. For me, this has been uh, 10 years in the making. Um, I've kind of been pushing the facilities. Um, people don't advocate for the buildings as much as they should and the spaces. Um, it is a long-term plan. Um, one of the reasons I ran for the school board was in order to get elementary air conditioning and uh, that's kind of one of the big wins I think we did when we did that with a balanced budget and we did that by spending our capital reserves. Um, but over the years I've seen us do it piecemeal. And so the fact that we have a plan, I think it's a great plan, um, but it is a plan. And as we've alluded to, um, future boards are gonna need to approve the implementation th of the plan um, or disprove certain parts of it. Um, and so there's still an opportunity for community input, for recommendations from administration, and ultimately for board approval. Um, and future boards are gonna need to consider um, the funding sources as well. So if, um, you know, making sure we have a balanced budget and before we go to the community for any um, recommendations, we're gonna need, um, the board is gonna need to approve that. So I, I look forward, you made the point, I look, I'm look. i stressing the point. Um, it's, a, it's a great plan, I'm very happy that we've gotten to this point, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done um, and making sure that it becomes a reality for our teachers, students, and community. Thank you. So I'm going to uh, reemphasize that when we approve the plan today, it's a plan and uh, specific projects will approve on a yearly basis like we always have been doing. Um, and uh, as you said, this is a living document, so it, it, there might be changes to what the plan outlines, but um, this gives us a very solid view of where we want to be and um, the different <coughs> projects that we need to stack up to go forward to bring our schools up to date and uh, for many years we put off maintenance and other changes in our buildings so this um, helps get us back on track with not only with uh, doing that uh, maintenance work but also modernizing and making sure that we have room for the class sizes and the classes that we are anticipating coming forward. Um, I 
truly appreciate all of the community input. As Mark said, it was a long list of pages of input, and I noticed um, that you know the modifications that you outlined tonight were triggered by some a lot of the comments that came up in the um, the write-ups. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate all my board members for looking at all of those also. So um, I want to make sure the community knows that their writing and their um, input has been received and reviewed. So thank you. So with that, I will ask Michelle to call the roll. Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Yes. And Ms. Gens? Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations. We're very happy to have this in place. Thank you. That's a big, big thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Next, we move to our action items. I need a motion and a second. Oh, we just did that. Sorry. Pass that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we now have a, our discussion item. We'll have a presentation from Ms. Jennifer Nomenmacher regarding chronic absenteeism. Now, can you hear me now? Okay, great. Yeah, this is the most nerve-wracking part, making sure the mic is right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm Jennifer Nonemaker, and my role is director of attendance and student engagement. I didn't see what was behind me, so I'm like thankful. Yeah, I'm like, okay. I'm not turning around looking.
Okay, now we're ready. So slide two of the presentation really talks about it, how, why attendance matters. And if you think collectively on average, if, if a student misses two days per month, then they miss 20 days a year, 30 hours of math instruction, 60 hours of reading and writing. And by the time they graduate high school, they would have missed one year of schooling. If it's four days per month, everything is doubled. And what we need to know and what we celebrate in District 204 is the wonderful work that's being done in our schools. And our curriculum is built around critical thinking and collaboration, and that doesn't happen when a student is at home. So attendance is very, very important, and something that I think through the COVID years, we didn't really know how much to push on that. We didn't want the students coming to, to school ill. We didn't want it spreading like wildfire through our schools. But at the same time, now that we're post-COVID and moving further away from COVID as being a global pandemic, we want our kids back and we want them back regularly every day because we appreciate them, we love teaching them, and great things are happening in our classrooms. If we move to slide three, we look at nationwide trends in chronic absenteeism. And I recently attended a workshop at the Regional Office of Education for du DuPage County where 12 schools were, 12 different school districts were represented, all um, surrounding the topic of chronic absenteeism and how our numbers are too high. In fact, the workshop facilitator, Dr. Pr Patricia Grasick, she said that nationwide and internationally, worldwide, the schools are, every school is suffering from tier one chronic absenteeism. And tier one chronic absenteeism means that at least tw they have a rate of 20% chronic absenteeism. So it's a nationwide problem, it's a worldwide problem. She did say, Every, every country in the world except for the Netherlands, which I thought was very interesting. In fact, um, when we were in the workshop, she said next week I'm traveling to the Netherlands and I'm going to study what it exactly the, it is that they're doing there so they don't have this exact same problem of chronic absenteeism as we do all over the world. So some of the um, highlights of the nationwide trends that I wanted to point out is the first bullet point Absenteeism increases throughout middle school and high school. So whatever they start out with in elementary, it's only gonna get higher. It, do, it doesn't tend to trend downward, it trends upward. Chronic absenteeism is more prevalent for specific underrepresented groups. In fact, in the next data slides, I'll show you, chronic absenteeism tends to mirror our achievement data. The groups that we worry about achievement data we're also worried about their attendance data. Students with high levels of absenteeism are at greater risk for dropping out of school than their peers with regular attendance. And if we talk about being college and career ready, again, that chronic absenteeism is going to make a big difference. The next slide um, talks about the data that we pulled from 2022-2023 school year. This is what I was talking about when I'm talking about the, the subgroups and how this data that's about chronic absenteeism tends to mirror our, our data that we talk about academic achievement and the same groups that we worry about with academic achievement problems. The next slide is uh, same, same year, same data, just a different way of looking at it. It's the chronic absenteeism by grade level. If you notice, our end caps are high. Our kindergarten numbers are high. Our, our 12th grade numbers are high. 12th grade, very predictable. Kindergarten, not so much. We're not sure what, what's happening there. But again, nationwide, everyone is looking at the same issues when it comes to the, the early grades, kindergarten, first grade. What's worrisome for me is looking at the elementary data, K through five, and how high it is. And 
if we go back to that slide, it talks about the nationwide trends. If we don't change that trajectory, what's going to happen to these same kids in middle school and high school when it comes to their attendance patterns? When I looked at the data, I said, okay, well, this is, this is for one year. How has this changed over time? So this next slide, I went back to the um, interactive report card site and I pulled up a sample IPSD high school and a sample IPSD elementary school. Truthfully, I looked at them all, but I just wanted to pull one for example. If you notice on the high school, the high school trends in 2018, we're looking at 16.7. In 2023, we're looking at 21.9. It's an increase, but it's not a huge increase. If we look at the elementary in 2018, we were looking at 10%. In 2023, we're looking at much higher than that. So why improve rates of attendance? It seems simple. If we decrease chronic absence, we increase academic performance. We think about elementary as the fundamental, uh, building the fundamental skills. I always use the analogy, if you have a home and you build the foundation of the home first and that foundation, you have to get it right. If you don't get that right, the home isn't a stable home. And it's the same with elementary and the fundamental skills that are taught in elementary. In addition to that, we talk about this inter interdependence between a sense of belonging and attendance and behaviors and social emotional skills and the academic skills. All of that independence, the, everything needs to work together. If the kids aren't there, it's a, it's a very critical piece that's missing from their education. So for District 204, what is the correlation between chronic absenteeism and achievement? Please know that this isn't a pure study. There are so many factors that go into academic achievement. There are so many factors that go into chronic absence. But if we were just to say, ask the question, how, do, how does it look? Is there a correlation between chronic absenteeism and achievement? You can see there, IAR, that's something that we would look at in elementary and middle schools. If we look at the proficiency level and then the growth level, there's significantly impact, impacted, there's a significant difference between those who are chronically absent and those who are not chronically absent. Next slide talks about SAT scores. And this is something we would look at at high school. Again, we see significant differences both in SAT scores and high school GPA, those who are chronically absent and those who are not chronically absent. So it's obvious that we have a problem and it's obvious that it's a problem worth caring about. And so what I wanted to focus this next section of the presentation on what, how we're responding to it. What are we doing about this? Because obviously the data shows we need to be doing something. So we're using a safe and civil schools model for improving attendance. This is aligned to our DePage Regional Office of Education. They, they use the same model for improving attendance. And it really is a collaborative effort among all stakeholders. We need everyone in the school involved. We need, we need to work with families, not against families. And so we need to make sure that it's not punitive, but supportive. Um, no, I read a book that said, and the author said, there's no research out there that said, if you punish kids they will, who are not coming to school, they will not uh, all of a sudden say, oh, I'm going to go to school. So you can't punish it, punish them, you can't, you have to really work at the root of the problem. And there are several, you know, different reasons why students may be absent. So it's a very, um, 
complex problem to solve. It's not a one-size-fits-all model. So Attendance Works is a great site that we use um, in District 204 to give us resources and ideas as to how to combat chronic absenteeism. And there are four main causes or categories that we could put attendance into. Barriers, aversion, disengagement, and misconceptions. And so what would happen at a school level is um, school-based teams, they look at their lists of chronic absentees and they, they take it by a case-by-case -case basis and what every single person um, who works with that student who's on that team, what they know about what's going on with that student, with their family, with their housing situation, and they determine which of the four categories would that student fit into. Based upon where that student fits and the absences fit in terms of categories, then they can customize an intervention plan for those students. We also need a systems approach because it's, there is that interdependence between academics, behavior, attendance, and social emotional learning. We need to make sure that we use a tiered approach just like we would for academics, just like we would for behavior. Uh, it makes it a much more manageable process when we have a systems approach to uh, combating chronic, chronic absenteeism. So I've worked a lot in my new role with elementary schools and one of the, um, Ro that Laura Rosenblum and I, we discussed how due to timing, due to needs of the buildings, everything that goes into school improvement planning, some buildings may have a school improvement goal aligned to attendance and some may not. But based upon the data that we were looking at, we really decided that we wanted all schools to have an attendance improvement plan. It didn't have to be elaborate, elaborative, elaborate. It didn't have to be anything that they spent a lot of time creating. We just really wanted them to be intentional about thinking about how can we improve chronic absenteeism in our building. And so we had a uh, special work time. Laura was gracious enough to give meeting time so that the principals could work, work and help each other with their plans. So for tonight's purposes and the purpose of this presentation, again, we have Mrs. Lori Shu here, and she's going to talk about McCarty's plan and what they've done. And they really have been front runners in this work. And I just, I think the world of the work that all of the elementary principals are doing to improve attendance. And, and Lori is just going to give an example of how they've done it at McCarty. So I'm going to turn the microphone over, get her all set. All right, thank you for having me tonight. And I do want to say that it is definitely a team approach at McCarty. So while I'm here representing our school, um, I am very happy to work with all of the staff that I do to help and support the students. So we, a couple years ago, were looking at attendance and we knew it was a concern. We wanted our students at school, besides attending throughout the whole day, getting to school on time, because late arrival is a concern for us as well. So we decided, as Jennifer was speaking, we a couple years ago decided we needed to with academics and behavior, and that was through the three-tiered supports. So that first level of support, that level one, is the universal approach, meaning all students need some sort of teaching. As it was discussed, attendance is a behavior that we need to figure out what is the reason behind it. A student coming late to school, that's a behavior. Why is that occurring and how can we help? That's the most important thing. What can we do to help? So that universal is pulling that classroom teacher in. The classroom teacher is the one, ideally, who has that strongest relationship with the students and their families. So what could we do first? That's, of course, having the teachers teach what they do best and make connections with the students. They're giving a brief lesson about the importance of being at school and the importance of being to school on time. For McCarty, for our PBIS, one of our um, uh, 
mottos is being ready. So the teachers are able to tie in being ready to coming to school on time and what does that look like. We've also pulled our PBIS team in to uh, create a video to show our Max the Mustang getting ready at home and then getting to school on time and showing what that looks like. So bringing fun into it, but also stressing the importance. While that's all done for the students, the teachers are also talking to the parents at curriculum night, as well as parent-teacher conferences, providing research that's been provided to our schools to provide to the parents as well, as well as having their report cards that show the attendance and late arrivals as well as we send out that district letter at the end of each quarter. So that's a universal approach. Something else the classroom teachers are doing is greeting students at the classroom door and handing out our Mustang Pride tickets occasionally for that being ready, just that catch you doing the right thing and what you're supposed to do. Finally, a step that we've added about a year or two ago was having a classroom teacher email or make a phone call to parents when their child has reached missing eight and a half days of school. That means that they are halfway to missing 10% of the school year. So when a child is at that point, we have the classroom teacher making that call. Again, they should be the one that has that strongest relationship already with that family. They're also recognizing why the child is not at school. Maybe it is a vacation. Maybe that child has been sick. Maybe it was doctor's appointments, but they're able to point out to the parent how many days the child has missed and talk about the importance of the child being at school and what it is they might be missing. So that's our tier one and just some examples. We then move on to our tier two approach. When a child is school or 12 and a half late arrivals or tardies to school. That is when myself or Sherry Fredericks, McCarty's principal, either her or I would make a direct phone call to that family. And that phone call is seeking out how can we help you? We recognize, especially after making all of these calls, parents are not making a choice typically to have their kids just stay at home. There's a reason behind it. So we're calling to offer what help and support can we provide? Because often as a school, we have way more resources that we can provide. Data in front of us, whether it is them coming late to school or that they've gone on vacation for 10 days and now their child's been sick for three days. So we're able to identify the reason why and kind of talk that through with the uh, parents. If we're not able to offer our exact help over the phone, that's when we are pulling on our resources, like our school nurse, our Title I facilitator, our SEL coach, our social workers, or again, pulling in that classroom teacher. Some examples that I just briefly wanted to share from those phone calls and reaching out to parents. You find out those parents that are working the third shift, that they're getting home at 8.15 in the morning, another family member is with the kids overnight, but that parent is still within a half an hour trying to get their kids ready for school and out the door. And then you hear that their child might be giving the parent the same concerns they're giving that teacher in the classroom and not following all expectations and routines. So we have sat down with individual students and made a morning checklist. We sat down with the child, found out what do your parents want you to do in the morning to get ready? What do they not want you to do? We make that task, task strip for them just like we would at school, laminate it, We've given them three, put it in the bathroom, the kitchen, and your bedroom, and that's just another useful tool for that student to become more independent, but also help that parent. We have had situations, and I think this is coming off of COVID, that parents are more likely to keep their child home if they have the sniffles or other 
illnesses, let's say that we're still okay with them coming to school. So when the parents have shared that with us, we might then have the nurse make that follow-up phone call to really talk about the policy on when kids can still come to school or giving that parent the right to call the nurse in the morning to say, hey, this is what's going on, and that has proven to be helpful as well. Sometimes we have family members that have lost other family members, and they do not necessarily want to let go of their child to head off to school. And the parent will say, I'm having a hard time. We have said, call us any of those days. We'll have a classroom teacher or a social worker give you a call to help get that student excited for coming to school and even do a home visit if necessary to help that child get to school. Sometimes it's just that phone call of awareness. And I look at that with many of the families that choose to do vacations over the school year, that when they have that five days or 10 days for a vacation, as soon as your child is sick just for a couple days, that brings them so much closer to that 10%. So those are just a couple examples of that tier two. And then moving to that tier three, that's really when they're at what we've chosen 14 and a half days. Again, that 17 days is when you are at that 10%. Um, so when we are at that 14 and a half days, it is a follow-up phone call, again, from myself or our principal. And again, it's what can we be doing differently? We've offered some support. We're seeing that there is still a concern. Um, and we might be turning then to our individual student support team in which we would invite the parent in for a meeting to talk about how we can problem solve through that differently. We at this time might be reaching out to Jennifer, our director of attendance, to see what we can be doing differently or even offering up some wrap services. So that's just a couple examples of what we've done at McCarty at those three different tiers. So just to sum this up, this is bigger than a school report card. It's bigger than the numbers. It's, it's, it's really tied to our portrait of a graduate. Long-term outcomes for improved attendance, it hits all levels. For students, it gives them more options for a bright future. I have a senior at home and I tell him often, we're not gonna close any doors. We're keeping every door open. Part of keeping every door open is regular attendance. They, we need to have these, these students ready for employment, college, and career. No matter what path they choose, good attendance patterns is part of it. Schools, we want to fulfill our mission to provide equal access to quality education. As I said before, our curriculums are built around collaboration and critical thinking that can best be done in the classroom setting. Can't be done at the kitchen table at home. States need educated workforces that are competitive in a global economy and communities need young adults ready to participate in civic life and local employment. So that's the whole big picture of improving student attendance attendance. It's very important and it's a commitment that I would love for us all to share in District 204. And just one closing thought. I saw this over the summer and I thought of my own, my, my own sick days when I was a student. And I'd have to say that we had three TV channels. The TV in my room was black and white. And it wasn't so interesting staying home from school. Now the kids have social media. Um, many kids are still dialed into their friends when they're at home. But also, while it's not as simple as three channels and a black and white TV, there's also a lot going on in the, in, in, on social media and in the world that makes it a scarier place and make schools the very best place for students every day. 
So while I enjoyed watching The Price is Right when I had my sick days from school, I really do believe that the very best place for our District 204 students is in District 204 schools. And I really want them to, um, I, I just really ask families to get on board, students to get on board, and to recognize the value of regular attendance every day. It matters a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gentz. Well, I want to start by thanking you guys so much for this presentation. Um, I, I do think that parents, a lot of them just don't realize how detrimental chronic absenteeism is and how common it is really now, like you guys said, not just in our district, but you know, nationwide. And I just had a couple questions, and it, it's more for, I think, getting, helping to get parents more understanding of you know, what absenteeism is considered, like especially when it comes to like doctor's appointments. I, I think, you know, parents don't realize how long do they have to be in school for it to be considered present. They're there half the day and then they decide to keep them home instead of bringing them back to school, you know, an hour later, you know, would that be considered present if they're gone just like an hour and they come back as opposed to keeping them, you know, home for, last three hours so for state reporting purposes we report student attendance in quarter days okay. so if a student is present for a quarter day they get th three-fourths of a day absence um, and so forth and so on so that that's how attendance is calculated so really every every minute they're there does count okay that's good to know honestly thank you I, I am guilty of having to bring my son to the orthodontist a lot in mornings but um, I do always send him back. And then um, the only other question I had was, again, more of a parent education kind of thing. As you were saying, because of COVID, we, we were very strict on, you know, if you have almost really anything, any symptom of anything, keep your child home. Is there going to be some sort of district-wide thing so it'll be consistent? expectations at every school of what you should keep them home for and what you shouldn't and again parents I know will always use their discretion anyway but maybe more of a set of guidelines that can help them decide if they should send them or not very early in the school year we did send out communication that we were going back to the procedures and those procedures were outlined but you make a very good point that perhaps a reminder would be very helpful also, Dr. Talley had a, a fantastic suggestion that perhaps a video go out with uh, frequently asked questions, similar to the question that you just asked about what okay. does count, what doesn't count, because we do think that there are some misconceptions out there. So that's something I'm currently working on. No, that's great. I think that's a wonderful idea, because there is, there's a lot of confusion, and I, I do think some parents, if they realized, you know, even just keeping them home it, those two or three hours instead of bringing them back, that has an impact too. So again, I know this is a very hard issue to tackle. I so appreciate though you, you know, telling us what you guys have done at McCarty and I so appreciate all the work you're doing, you know, too. So thank you both. Those were all my questions. Victoria, do you have any questions or comments about attendance? And I do have one comment, thank you. Um, I think the addition of mental health days definitely makes this a lot more interesting because when you consider like younger students, I think that school in this day and age is very necessary for them to develop proper social emotional skills. But then at the same time, a lot of high school students who may have good social emotional skills may be the ones saying, oh, I need to take off in order to not get burnt out. And so I think it'll be really interesting to see the specific breakdown of what absences are actually recorded as whether they are mental health days or other reasons so that um, me and the student advisory board can actually be proper role models for why students are actually missing school and target those concerns from a student perspective so thank you how many do they get mental health days five victoria that was a very insightful comment thank you very much thank you okay, thanks mr karubas really just a comment you know 
educational equity, educational, equal educational opportunity. That's the legal minimum. We're supposed to provide an opportunity. Um, and so we could take the position, here we are, doors are open, don't show up, then you're not, you're not a student, you're not, we're not going to help you. Um, but I lo love how we try to expand that opportunity um, and try to figure out the, the why and try to help. Um, yeah, I, th I think equity requires us to look, try to remove certain barriers um, you know, when appropriate. And um, some of it is, is what we're doing. And, and the example that has been talked about is the, um, you know, the parent guardian education about how sick is too sick. Um, and then, you know, empowering them that sh you can call the nurse because some people, some groups are, um, are more intimidated for doing that. Um, and then here's the number. Um, you know, so that they have the, a means and a, it's easy for them to do. So I think you can see where um, by trying to extend the opportunity beyond just, you know, you, the student wasn't dropped off and wasn't here, um, we can go a long way to improving attendance and whether you call it, you know, chronic or um, truant or um, throw it in a category. I think the important aspect of it is trying to do the educational. Um, and then, you know, we talked about the academic performance, you know, but it uh, absent student impacts kind of the whole system where it impacts the classmates, it impacts the teacher, and you can see how much um, work the other. Um, support staff and administration is doing and trying to uh, you know increase attendance so it uh, you know it's a stress it's a burden on the whole system so in trying to make it more efficient um, reducing uh, the absenteeism is, is a benefit to to all involved so that's just a comment no no question there thank, thank you. you miss Deming. Um, thank you so much for talking about creating the video. I think that will be really, really critical and helpful. I, because I did have uh, one of the things that I think is really helpful, because I've had some illumination, is making sure that we all understand what is an absence, what counts mm -hmm. as an absence. And so that's something that I think uh, can be extremely beneficial. Are there, are there like, uh, two, three, or four things that you can, can share just a, as we state now, um, as we said now, that we might not think could be counted as an absence that would be illuminating? So, or, or if you can share what, what is counted as an absence. Sure, so there were questions about, is, when you leave for a medical appointment, does that count as an absence or, or does it not count? Is it a certain, certain amount of the time of the day? If you're there until 1 o'clock and then you leave after 1 o'clock, does that count? Those are all questions circulating. Um, some parents did not realize that um, any excused absence counted in the chronic absenteeism percentage. They, they only felt like, oh, well, that's the, the truancy or the un, unverified or moms who didn't call in for their kids. That, that's what that's all about. Um, which that's, we used to only track truancy we did, and average daily attendance. We didn't have a, a state reporting mechanism for chronic absenteeism. It's relatively new, started in 2018. <coughs> so there, there are some misconceptions out there about, about those types of things um, that the questions are coming up. So I think it's a, it's a, great, um, it's a great communication strategy to just put that out there so everybody's on the same page. Yeah, because sure. even the mental health days count as yes. days off. Yes. Any day yeah. off counts mm -hmm. towards that chronic absenteeism number, yeah. Yes, the elementary principals have been quite vocal that 
if Governor Pritzker gave them, it shouldn't count them against us. Okay. Um, slide two was just, I, I think, is, is extremely um, helpful. Just that consciousness to, to recognize you, know, you think, okay, I'm only missing two days and, and then mm -hmm. another two days. But to show how that all builds makes people think, oh, okay, I, I get it. Mm -hmm. So that's, please include something like that as you do the video. That's really, really helpful. Um, slide eight, talking about the foundation because building blocks, just as we talk about what's, you know, students one, two, three, A, B, C, that's, that's the foundation and sharing, helping us to remember in all of us, especially looking at our numbers at the elementary level. Sometimes we think, oh, it's just when I get to high school, you know, when I become a sophomore, that's when it's really, but if we don't have that foundation and being able to share that, reiterate that, I ask you in the video as well, is really, really critical because showing the foundation and, and drawing those, um, that comparison and, and linking that, I think is, is really, really important. And then just two other things, one comment. I love the positiveness, mm -hmm. helping us and helping parents to understand and children to understand. We're not talking punitive here, we're trying to work with families. That is so, so critical, helping us to, un helping people to understand we're opening our arms. We want our, your students to be successful here as they you know, graduate, with, but it, it all begins at whatever stage. So thank you for that positiveness and, and helping families to feel that they, can, that they can work with us to help find a solution. Um, Lori, have we seen, have you been able to look, I'm not sure how long you've been working in your, in your program at McCarty, have you been able to ascertain any results yet or, or see a difference uh, in, your, in your students and families? Yes, so last year our SIP goal was regarding attendance and we did see improvement, um, so a couple percentage point improvement by doing this. So this is our second year then to have a SIP goal in this area as well. Okay, so you'll be able, to, so by the end of the year, you'll be able to, okay. it'll be great to be able to share that, what you've seen and what your base was and then what that, that change is. Um, and then, let's see. I'm happy to hear each school has a specific improvement, attendance improvement plan and that we're not just talking generalizations, but each specific school is taking a look at what needs to be done. Thank you. Mr. Rising. So I first think I actually want to start out with asking Dr. Talley a question. <laughs> um, there was once upon a time before evidence-based funding that attendance and average daily attendance did affect our funding. Uh, but I want to clarify that no longer does average daily attendance impact our funding as it once did in the state of Illinois. Um, it's more based on local resources and that type of thing. Um, but I just wanted Dr. Talley just briefly maybe to touch on, uh, besides the obvious impact of student achievement, performance, proficiency, that we strongly believe is impacted by chronic absenteeism, what has or, or what has and what what is chronic absenteeism currently affecting and where I'm leaning towards that is report cards and that type of thing. I just wanted if you could touch on that briefly uh, because it does make a difference for our district because we do want those kids in schools learning, but talk about what it has impacted. Well, yes, you're, you're right. It does impact uh, learning, individual learning, and even collaborative learning, if you think about it, because students are working together, and that's one of our uh, portraits of a graduate item. We want them to be able to work in pairs and collaboratively. To the point of your, what you're speaking about of the report card data, um, at the elementary level, chronic absenteeism counts 20% of the report card grade for every school. At the high school, at, at, that's at the um, elementary and middle school level. At the high school level, it counts for 
accounts for 10 percent, I'm sorry, of the, um, of the report card grade. And so therefore, we know, for example, Wabonzi, uh, which is rated as commendable, could have been rated as exemplary if only 10 fewer students had not been chronically absent. So that's how it makes a difference. And then the ratings of the schools are something that people look at. Uh, and I'm not saying it's the be all and end all by, by any means of how you rate a school. You've quoted me before about what to look for in a school. Um, but um, I think it is part of it all. Yeah, thanks. Um, and then I th thank you so much for talking about what you're doing, especially at McCarty, but what you're looking to do within all the elementary schools. Um, I think it's extremely important. I've watched numerous videos on chronic absenteeism. I've watched what AESA has done and talked about it for all superintendents across the country. Um, and the reality is, is that they don't want to hear the district or district administrators or the Board of Education telling them how important chronic absenteeism and how important it is to be in school, they want to hear it from the teachers, um, who those kids and those families are the most closest to and how it impacts their individual student. Not how it impacts the school, but how it impacts your individual student. And I think when we make it personal, it has more impact. Um, but here's my concern. <laughs> Teachers are already asked to do a ton. Teachers are already spread thin. Teachers are having to help those kids when they are absent. Um, but this is one of those things that I personally ask the teachers, uh, especially at the elementary school level. I know it's obviously harder at the middle school and high school level. Um, but our district wants to help the teachers and our district wants to get them those resources and and stress how important and how we really need their help in this in this effort would you agree absolutely and i just wanted to share to help our teachers because we know they have a lot on their plates we've helped create a script to email out and they're still making it very specific to their child but it's one less thing that they have to construct an email it's kind of there for them and again specific then for the student is done by the teacher yeah. whether it's that phone call or email so we do recognize that um, but like you said if the kids are at school that's better for the teacher too so and, and i have a feeling it is we're going to see the turnaround i hope quickly more quickly at the elementary school level my concern obviously is still the, the high school the middle school and the high school level um, and we might have to, with, with, with Brad and, and with Nicole as assistant superintendents of middle school and high school, we might have to let, have them funnel down like, okay, when teachers are having teacher conferences that they need to bring up and have those discussions about the student being out of school so much. I, I mean, because I think parents are engaged when it comes to the performance of their student. If the performance of their student can be directly tied back to chronic absenteeism, then it needs to be men mentioned, at least mentioned to the, to the family. So um, yeah, thank you for that. Uh, slide 12 really quick. Um, and and Ms. Deming also spoke to this too, as far as looking and evaluating and kind of going through for our own well-being, some of these checklists for the individual student. I think these are always important. I, will, I think they are going to continuously be more important as we move forward in the future. But what I will also say is these are the same students that we had two and three years ago. And if you can go to slide five to that point, um, if you look at, now again, people need to keep in mind this slide is for all students at all grade levels. The chronic absenteeism rate, the average for our district is 19% in 2023. To give you a, a, a comparison, in 2019, our last full school year before the pandemic, we were at 8.7% chronic absenteeism. It is more than doubled in three years. 
20% of the kids in our district are chronically absent. And in some cases, when we break it down further, as you know, when we look at individual schools and individual groups that we measure, there is upwards of 40% absenteeism, and we've talked about this before. When your kid's out of school four to 10 days, I, 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 how can they learn? They're out half the time. And then if you go to slide four, the one right before that, um, you know, obviously we need to address these areas of students that are 30%. I mean, I don't have to tell you, and I'm, I'm sure you've looked at the data at each school, and um, you know, especially when it rises at 40%. And then I'll just reiterate what everybody else said. Slide two, as far as I'm concerned, if you could just pop it up again, because I think it was so important. Um, I wish we could print this out, email this out as a district, put it up in the schools, every hallway that they turn down and parents see it, students see it. Um, this is impactful and this means something because when you're, like you said, your kid has gone two days a month, that is a year's worth of school. I, I, mean, I mean, how more impactful can that be? And I think that video will help too to kind of tie into a campaign as far as I'm concerned that we have to have as a district. So thank you for all the work and thank you for what you're doing at McCarty and your whole team. So right before I came, I had the most frustrating thing that I read on um, the internet, Facebook, which I don't ever write on Facebook, but I had to write something and I shared this with the board and I shouldn't have read it before I came to hear this talk about absenteeism because it was apparent in our district saying that they had pulled their child out to go to Disney for six days and then their child had been sick for a couple of things and they're starting to get these letters and how should they react to these letters and there were over 150 comments that were written and I would say at least 90 percent of them I had to go far 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 down before I found someone that said you know and it was a second grader so they're like eh, you know um, but pretty much all of them were like you go for it you need to enjoy your family and you know, this is an experience that you know you can't repeat later and finally somebody said well it could impact their learning but also it could impact the rating of the school because uh, absenteeism chronic absenteeism can affect how the school is rated and if you like your home value price you want to have a good school that everybody wants to go to I think that people have no idea that that impacts the rating. I mean, besides the academics that your child might miss, like I was thinking if I'm a second grade teacher, I have a student that is out for six days and I'm trying to teach some, some concept. They are behind when they come back those six full days of learning math or whatever it is. And even in second grade, they have very meaningful foundation foundational things that they learn so it was very frustrating i had to say something which i never do on facebook but i had to put in a couple words um, to support the one parent that was kind of trying to lay a reality but I, I really think that there's a mindset that it's okay to just not be at school and and i also don't think they figure add up how many days this adds up to um, but that parent also said that they already had plans for in the spring to pull their child out for another vacation so it's like and it wasn't during this it was during school days so they would miss school days again so it's like i really felt that was like a pure example of what's going on here and it's like the, the way parents think now about sending their kids to school and um, it's really unfortunate and what you said in your presentation really concerned me because it was something I didn't I didn't get before that the students at the elementary level it gets worse as they get older I mean they have this pattern now oh it's okay to be out of school for 18 days or whatever and then what is it like when they get to high school it's probably worse you know so um, it is very concerning I um, I don't know how to impress parents enough that their kids need to be in school for collaborative learning for the sake of the teacher also being able to effectively you know support all of these students but um, uh, I really I I find it very troubling, and that was a very troubling message to read. 
Um, we do have subgroups that are higher than 40% uh, chronically absent, and you just can't be successful with that type of missing of school. Um, so I'm really happy that, as others have said, that all of the schools have a plan for school um, attendance because I feel like it's all, also kind of like whack-a-mole. Well, maybe ours isn't that bad, but guess what? This year you had a bunch of students that were out and now suddenly you have the problem. It, it, it needs to be more of a universal mindset, like kids need to be in school and um, you know how do we make that happen? So I really appreciate the work that's being done at McCarthy. I hope um, the things that you're working on are being shared with the other schools because I do feel like some of them are like, woo, my kids were only at 29% this year, so I didn't get on the bad list. But um, you know, I think it, uh, it's something that is a possibility in every one of our schools. In fact, Springbrook, right, they were mm -hmm. rated the top elementary in the state the year before. And this year they dropped down and I, I asked questions, why did that happen? Attendance was what was a big factor of um, making them move down in the ratings. So it's like, I think all of the parents <laughs> need more education on this. And um, I do agree that teachers are ones that can reinforce this with the students too. Like, you know, it's important to be in class, reinforce it with the um, parents also. So. Um, it's a, it's a troubling topic, and I'm glad that we have people focused on it and working to try and improve it. Uh, so thank you very much. All right, now we have a presentation from Dr. Lewis Lee regarding summer learning. Nothing follows increased motivators for attendance than summer programs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I try to. Good evening, uh, President Donahue, board members, Dr. Talley, student board members. Thank you for the opportunity to present tonight regarding our summer learning update six months from now. Uh, tonight's presentation includes several board policies as well as it's tied to our strategic plan, uh, Priority Objective One. Uh, several things that I'd like to talk about tonight, and some of these will be an update of uh, of what I talked about earlier this summer, and the first will be a review of what's happened this past summer, 2023, in all of our schools, uh, for a majority of them. I'd uh, like to talk a little bit about how uh, a lot of our grant work, especially our ESSER three grants, were used to help uh, in the sustainability of some of our summer programming. And then finally, just talk a little bit and give a preview of what summer 2024 will look like. And we're almost there. That being said, um, you may remember the American Rescue Plan was a grant set up by the federal government to address learning loss that occurred as a result of the pandemic. And we received our share of those federal funds as school districts did across the country. Our share was just over $9 million. 20% of that had to be dedicated to address learning loss. The federal government used states to serve as the mechanism to distribute those funds, and another directive of at least 70% of the funds that states gave had to address learning loss. Uh, the rest of that could be directed towards summer enrichment and then also after school programs. We were able to well meet that benchmark of 20%, uh, which I would consider a pretty low benchmark for districts, and we were well. The table that you have in front of you is the actual budget that we used starting um, 
with the ESSER three funds. Uh, this uh, shows a comprehensive uh, general listing of how those funds were allocated. This document is also available on our website for the public to continue to take a look at so that they have a, a transparent understanding of how we use those funds. So let's talk a little bit about ESSER III uh, as one of the initial leading grants that we use in some of our programming. And then I'll follow this up with some several other grants that we were also able to use to address some of our summer programming. When we look at the ESSER III grant, we had about a million dollars in investments that we were able to use this past summer. Three quarters of a million dollars all went towards all of our elementary students. And that was in some of those tote bags that every single one of our elementary teachers, uh, elementary students were able to take home. Uh, they were all able to take home uh, books for summer reading. We included math kits. This was the second year in doing that. Our pre-K students all received that. And I'll talk a little bit later about we just didn't want those summer to totes to just focus on those individual students, uh, but also how can parents be engaged in those um, summer book readings, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. The remaining quarter of a million dollars went towards transportation and some of the summer teachers who were also involved um, with that investment. This slide really shows how many things are happening in our schools. When you think about summer school, it's not what you would see back in the day where students are just coming in and, and sitting and trying to learn uh, and catch up on a particular subject. Our summer program is robust, it's unique, it's exciting, it's educational, it's fun. It's all of these things that summer should be. And when you look at um, some of these pictures, they really talk about some of the amazing things that have taken place in our summer. I will uh, do my best to, to capture what the spirit of each one of these is, uh, but a lot of it is just things that are, were happening on a daily basis that I just won't, wouldn't be able to capture in words. So let's talk a little bit about some of the overall summer opportunities that I was alluding to earlier with the ESSER grant funds. Again, the totes were a big piece of that. The second part was off being able to offer something from early, early childhood, excuse me, all summer enrichment opportunities uh, to further provide um, more additional SEL um, skill set work and just uh, to help them with summer engagement work. So that family engagement piece, um, what we offered with the help of our teachers was these virtual opportunities for every single parent uh, to, uh, over a six week process, to uh, log on and uh, have an interaction where we were able to go and talk about grade level specific content. Some of those related to some of the books that were there, some of those related to some SEL work. Um, it was great to see that we had many parents and students who were a part of this. Um, the, um, the students and families that were engaged with this gave us feedback that they really enjoyed doing this with their students. It really just gave another opportunity, another point of, of evidence for them when they're actually engaging with students. We know that research shows that the more engaged they are in their child's education, the more successful that student, their child is going to be, and the more that they're actually going to learn something themselves about seeing the growth uh, in their students. Transitioning out of the ESSER grant, we were uh, also able to continue uh, our club hub. And the club hub was, we were in the second year of a, um, of a grant that we received uh, through, um, it's a 21st century grant that we were able to receive. It's a five-year grant, um, totaling about $300,000. And with this grant, as you can see, this is a sample of what the five weeks look like. And we used um, a program called Camp Invention, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a little bit. And 
What's unique about this Club Hub is not only were students um, exposed to different things, different STEM-related activities during the week, but again, that entire piece of that family engagement was at the centerpiece of this. You'll see examples of several field trips that the students were able to take on. Everything that we wanted to do this summer really tried to make sure, especially at that early um, at our elementary levels, to have parents involved as much as we possibly could. Another grant that we uh, we're in our second year of is our Peace of Mind grant. And the exciting piece of this is really we were able to par partner with a local artist for the second year in a row, Laura Lynn. And this grant really focused on not only supporting mental health and wellness, but also allowing students to be able to express themselves both creativity, creativity, wow, I can't say that word. They express their creativity, thank you and their emotions either through drawing, painting, uh, sketching, using color, all the different things that uh, we know is just a further extension of students' talents and how they can express their um, different things that they're learning. Talked a little bit about those summer totes. If we were to unpack them, what you would see is um, this itemized uh, piece of what the actual cost of some of those books were. Um, the only thing I would add to this is this is that we also looked at our bilingual students, both in English and Spanish, and we're able to offer that. Uh, students who are eligible for our McKinney Bento services, they actually received uh, just an extra scholastic pack of books, and then also uh, we were able to um, provide additional um, additional books for our 7th through 12th grade students as well. And again, those summer totes, this was our second year that we were able to use those math kits. So I'd like to talk a little bit about by level of our academic boost programs and what that looked like, not just at the elementary level, but also at the middle school level. Um, as, the, as you can see on the screen, we actually sent out invites to just over 500 students. This, this um, program took place over 12 days, two hours per day, in which we really wanted to work with students, not just on academic uh, pieces that would help address that um, learning, uh, prevent that summer slide, but also provide opportunities where they can engage in a um, atmosphere that provided um, extra uh, curricular activities where Again, if you were to go in through those, those two hours per day, uh, they were doing other things uh, than just what you might see in a traditional classroom. At the middle school, um, again, we extended invites to just over 300 students. Um, this program took place uh, over uh, a, a two-week period, and we were able to increase the number of hours per day to three hours. Earlier I talked about that Camp Invention, and Camp Invention is a program that um, we've been partnering with where they, it's a STEM program, and they actually work with the National Inventors Hall of Fame. And the, the whole uh, point of that organization is to really build a direct connection uh, to different insights from world-changing inventors. It's a unique program that really puts our students in touch with what it means uh, to be exposed to developing a passion for innovation, not only through their, um, uh, through their early childhood lives, but also through their adult lives. Uh, some of the parent feedback we got um, that I'll just read, um, as you can see up there, is one parent talked about how they truly believe that the program was a great impact for their child, and it boosted her skills with peers, as well as having a positive outcome towards her future. It's great for us to receive that type of feedback. We know that um, as we're building these programs and making sure that we're putting these out in the communities, we want to make sure that they continue to be programs where students are gonna succeed, and again, where we know we have that family engagement piece that's really positive for all of our families. Finally, at our high schools, uh, we continued uh, our summer bridge programs that occurs at all three of our high schools and have been in place for quite some time. Um, 
through our summer bridge programs, we had uh, about 40 students per building, so a total of 120 students. And each of these bridge programs really wanted to focus on what we know uh, for students starting high school, that freshman on track number is really crucially important. Uh, those algebra one and having those set of skills uh, so that they can, those foundational skills so that they can be set on the road to success, all of those things. As much as we can have them in over the summer to help give them that extra push uh, so that they can hit the ground running is only going to set them up for future academic success. We also were able to offer our uh, K through eight uh, STEM camp. This STEM, STEM camp continues to be extremely popular. Uh, you will see that uh, we were really excited that we had just over 700 student participants uh, this past summer. Uh, just previously, we just had over 400. So we continue to know that not only this, is this um, camp extremely popular, but we're continually f trying to find ways that we can expand it. Our online summer learning continues to offer uh, robust uh, course offerings for our students who want to, uh, at the high school level, who want to continue to either fulfill a class requirement during the summer so that they can find room in their fall and spring schedules. Uh, this program, we had um, just over 1,600, almost 1,700 students that just about matched a record enrollment that we had in the previous year of 2022 at just over 1,700. Uh, we continue to just see strong interest uh, and strong participation in this program. With that being said, um, this is a tuition-based program, uh, but we also provide um, fee waivers for students um, who, uh, based upon um, where they're at, at, their free and reduced status so that they can still participate as well. Our Freedom Schools grants. Um, you're going to hear a lot about our grants tonight. Uh, this was another opportunity uh, that we had to extend uh, and expand learning time, provide engaging activities for some of our students at the middle schools. And the unique piece about our Freedom Schools grant was that it went uh, towards a uh, group of some of our underrepresented uh, segment of our population to really increase that family time. This next slide really highlights some of the opportunities that we provided, not just for students, but for parents to go on different uh, field trips, not just locally, but throughout our city. Um, and then again, uh, this last uh, slide right here just shows all of the different um, uh, types of activities that were happening across both um, our middle schools along with our elementary schools so that families and uh, their children had an engaging um, atmosphere and opportunity uh, for learning. So uh, it's really important that we take a look at um, the measure of our students and how they're doing um, in terms of where they're coming from, um, where their backgrounds are, one of the challenges we have is just like you just heard with attendance is um, taking a look at the attendance of students um, in our summer programming. It's a challenge. Um, we have done everything we can to remove what we know are historically systemic barriers, whether it be through cost, all of these programs, other than the tuition-based program of, of summer, uh, even though we provided waivers, were offered at no cost, transportation, uh, we provided transportation to these programs. Um, in terms of time, we tried to make sure that, that students still had what we know is that important time um, that they can be outside of school. And with that, we, it's still a challenge to continue having students in these programs. This first slide shows the demographic groups from, from where uh, our summer boost programs from where our summer boost students came from, both at the elementary level and at the middle school level. And this, the second um, part of that um, chart really shows that in comparison to their demographic groups if we were to look at all 26,000 students in our school district. This second slide uh, takes a look at it from a race ethnicity standpoint and once again, taking a look at our boost students uh, at the elementary level, 
uh, which were just over 300 students. Um, and then also at the middle school level, which was uh, just over about 400 students. And again, based on their ethnicity, um, how their participation also uh, compared as, a, as it compares to our general population of students. When you look at K through eight, we had just over 800 students attend. Oh, I'm sorry, that were invited. We, we, we only had about half of that attend. So when I talked about that earlier challenge, that's the number right there. Um, what were some of the activities that we, we, we did to uh, not only invite those students, but to continue to invite students who maybe parents told us through previous obligations or we just weren't able to, to hear from? Um, I will tell you that the, the building's doing amazing jobs of doing everything. Uh, first, it started with a um, a letter from Dr. Talley, which who wouldn't want to get that letter? And that went to every single one of our elementary students. It was stuffed right in that summer tote bag, right on top. Uh, so that was the first thing that they did. And, and I talk about that because we wanted this to be as inclusive as possible. Um, and we knew we weren't gonna get all of them. In fact, that would have been an interesting um, dilemma if we had. I think we'd be looking at year-round schooling. Um, but that being said, um, all the schools also had their list of students who they knew through student engagement, through academics that they wanted to target. Uh, some of those lists came from buildings ILT teams. Some of them came from the uh, building principal themselves uh, or some of their um, SSEs. And so personal phone calls were also made in addition to emails. And with all of that effort, um, I can tell you it was, it was challenging for our schools to, to still only have 50% attendance based on the, the number that we invited. It's not something that, um, um, that we're, we're still not taking a look at, but we, we do have to take a look at it from a return on investment piece and, and the amount of uh, economic dollars that we are putting into this program. We want to be able to have uh, that solid return because uh, this is very important, um, whether it's through attendance, whether it's through making sure that that summer uh, slide doesn't occur, whether it's to making sure that students uh, are able to make that transition to high school and be able to start on solid footing. All of these are extremely important uh, to the <coughs> success and what we believe for every individual student. So that being said, I'd like to transition a little bit to what it, will it look like for summer of 2024. First of all, we've I've shared with this board that um, we know ESSER funds are expiring. That being said, some good news is that we still will be able to offer those summer totes, at least we know from an ESSER funding standpoint, one more time. Uh, so all of those, um, books and math kits have already been allocated for so we do plan on sending those homes again uh, for the summer of 2024. After that we, we will have to take a look uh, from an economic standpoint of, of what that'll look like for 2025 and beyond. We will continue to offer the K-8 through STEM camp. We know that continues to be a popular option for our students uh, and we hope that we'll be able to even expand that. We're currently still discussing what does summer look like based on the, some of the data that I've shared with you tonight. Some of the data I know that you have also um, uh, asked for um, as prior to this presentation. And then also just trying to take a look at what can we do to continually uh, have our students engaged in what we know uh, we can create as, as a really summer robust, robust program offering for all of our students. Here is a, I would say, a, a pretty final draft of what we believe some of the dates are. We know it's important for our families to have um, these dates out as quickly as we can so that they can build their own family schedules, we hope, surrounding these dates. Um, we plan, again, on offering at every single level, uh, elementary through high school. Uh, the STEM camps will be in year three of Club Hub. Uh, we'll continue to offer the Summer Art Club 
and um, our uh, um, online summer learning programs continues to um, be a, a, um, a great piece of summer course offerings for our high school students. With that, um, we're more than happy to take any uh, questions and comments that you may have uh, related to the presentation. Ms. Deming. Uh, Lewis, slide 23, Dr. Lee, I'm sorry, slide 23. And just um, uh, slide 23 and slide 24, I guess. On the, um, if you can remind me, the K through 8 STEM camp, are we able to provide um, waivers or? Yes, thank you for the question. For, for that, we are as well. Um, and um, the amount of those continues to be something we're taking a look at. Um, but um, I think, again, the, the, what, our, what our focus is is as, as much as we can for students who want to attend this and can be a part of this to remove any barriers uh, that may uh, be something that, uh, from a financial standpoint, we want to be able to remove that. Uh, in which schools were, are we able across, uh, is it spread throughout the district? I know we don't do it in each school, but how many schools and do we provide um, transportation or not? Yeah, for the K through 8 STEM camp, um, we, they are providing their own transportation. Um, I'll have to double check the number of schools it has changed uh, yearly just based upon um, the availability of schools. For based on either construction schedule or, or renovation of, uh, of classrooms. So uh, we have not set yet where that will take place for next year, um, but those are things that we're continuing having discussions about. Um, and I just asked about the waivers in transportation. I know you understand why asking about those, uh, just in case we have students who like to attend or families who would like their students to attend who can't, can't aren't aren't able to find the means to get there themselves. So um, I know you'll keep that, continue to keep that in mind. And then uh, finally, have we been able to yet see any results maybe from last year's summer camp for students involved um, in school this year? Or is that even a goal uh, to, to, uh, to have that type of assessment or not really just to be sure that we continue that learning um, as much as possible throughout the summer? Yeah, great question. I know several board members were, were asking that. Um, yes, we, we've been able to, to look at some of that data. The challenge is, so if we're looking at it from a, uh, an iReady score uh, piece, uh, as you all know, that iReady score is a, a diagnost diagnostic assessment that really is not designed so much for a grade or a score, but to really show where we can provide the best support for students. And as they answer those questions, as they get more right, uh, it makes those questions tougher. As they get uh, questions less right, then it makes those questions easier. So, but that said, taking a look at that with such a small sample of students and trying to make that true apples to apple uh, comparison, we also know that our students are not just involved in um, what's happening in our district, but some of them are taking, they're involved in a lot of different things. So um, we, we were able to see uh, some growth um, from um, both uh, an ELA standpoint and a math standpoint. While it was not really significant, I think the piece uh, that was more um, interesting and, and something that we want to keep an eye on was that there was a, a delta in the students who did not attend and that obviously showed that um, there was um, some summer learning loss that, that occurred for some of the students who did not attend um, that one program. Again, snapshot in time, two hours per day over 12 weeks. However, um, the students who didn't attend, there was some summer, summer learning loss that did occur. Thank you. The summer, the STEM camp last summer, Granger and Scullin. Victoria, do you have any comments or questions? Oh, no. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Krubus. No, uh, uh, Ms. Gentz. 
I would like to thank you for this wonderful presentation again. I, I do get so excited, as I know everyone else really does, to see all these amazing summer programs that we offer. And um, I just had a couple questions, and I do apologize if you already addressed it. Um, that Club Hub, it's at Georgetown and Longwood. Is it open to only Georgetown and Longwood students? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Would you be looking to expand it at some point if you know funding would allow that? Yeah, part of it is tied to that 21st century grant and okay. how it was written. Okay. So, um, um, you know, I, I think we'd have to just retake a look at that just to make sure, but a lot of it's just tied to that grant. Okay. No, that makes total sense. Um, and then you said how many students had been invited. How did you guys decide who got invited? Yeah, great question. So first of all, just want to reiterate for um, as much as we could the, the entire elementary population in mm -hmm. terms of some of the things that we could support virtually, the yeah. family engagement, we, we would love to have seen as, as many students as possible. Absolutely. The academic boost for elementary and middle, uh, a lot of those were targeted okay. and that was based on uh, whether a building felt that there were some students who they could increase their engagement levels mm -hmm. so that there was a stronger connection uh, between school and student. We know the, that the more they can make those connections, not only will attendance increase, but academics will follow. Uh, and so they were wanting to target some of those students to maintain that connection okay. throughout the summer. And then some of that was also based on what schools were seeing from an academic standpoint, mm -hmm. knowing that um, students could um, either um, needed additional supports. Um, also knowing that these were some students that everything that they could do to make sure that that summer uh, slide did not occur um, based upon what they were seeing maybe through a, a, um, some um, teacher recommendations. Um, the, the focus of it was systemic from the standpoint that you had building teams taking a look and all of the students and who to personally invite. Okay, no, that, thank you. Honestly, I was just wondering about that. And uh, will you be maybe looking to invite around the same amount this coming year, possibly? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we're talking about is we don't wanna keep doing something just to not only say that we're doing it, but if, it's, if we're not reaching uh, as many students then we, we need to take a look at, are, are th is there another way and mm -hmm. is there another offering that we could be providing that will expand our reach? To reach some more. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. So, yeah, those are my only questions, but thank you again, Dr. Lee, as always. Great presentation. Mr. Rising. Uh, slide 21. Uh, first of all, you know, I know when we talked about summer enrichment in the past, a big part of it was staffing. Um, how do we do this past year? And, and, and if I could just kind of point to the first thing up there, do, do we try to staff, and this is a good example, uh, but I will have something else to say. Do we staff for planning for 840 or when we get finally get the 418? I, I guess because that's my big question because I guess where I'm going with this is do we expect staffing to get a little easier kind of as, you know, teachers kind of know this is coming now and we've been fortunate enough to be able to we hired summer coordinators who really did a lot of the work um, and you know we it's not a surprise we have many of our teachers are, are really heavily invested in the work of our of our students and so we we plan for the 840 um, okay. and so it wasn't a matter of not being able to support them if they showed up uh, it was making sure that um, being able to support almost a thousand students, we wanted to be able to provide that environment and we were ready to do that. All right, so I guess I'm glad you answered that way because my next point on this slide is I'm not disappointed with administration, I'm not disappointed with our teachers, I'm disappointed with our parents. Um, and I, I'm gonna call it like it is, like this, this is abysmal to me, we invited 840 kids and less than half. Well, as a parent, 
I, I just can't, I, I, I understand families have extreme challenges. In the summer, I understand it's hard because you want your kids to have fun. But here your school's saying, we've identified your student as needing help. Like if I'm a parent, I'm bending over backwards to make sure my kid is number one, showing up to this, which we got less than 50%. And then number two, I'm making sure they're there more than 40%. I mean, I, I'm, it, it saddens me more than anything. Um, it, it saddens me for those students. And again, I understand that families have challenges and students have challenges. It's not easy. Um, but when you get a letter from Dr. Talley <laughs> um, and, and you recognize that your student needs help, uh, gee, man, as a parent, I'm bending over backwards to make sure they're there and they're there every single day. So um, hearing you say that we staff for 840, like I'm starting to think, okay, you know what? Maybe we start, maybe we start pulling in those kids that are borderline the middle of the road kids. They're kind of teetering towards, uh, you know, their grids are getting iffy. And we started start pulling in because I know we're being more targeted and more focused on the kids that really need that boost. But I'm starting to think. I mean, if I'm looking at the numbers for the STEM camp and the art enrichment camp, and we almost have twice as many kids that are going to those camps who are probably already high academic achieving kids and we've got twice as many showing up and my guess is the attendance rate is pretty good at those camps. I'm starting to think maybe we offer this to more kids that we know are gonna show up who, you know, I mean, because you, you can make something available but you can't always make kids go. And, um, and it's a shame because it breaks my heart because those are the kids that really need it. But if they're not going to take advantage of it, I'm starting to think, you know, maybe we need to think about that. And I don't know if you wanted to make any comments or just let me vent, rant. <laughs> I'll just say summer is a particularly challenging time, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic where you had a lot of families who felt like they needed to take advantage at, at some point in time when things started to open back up. It's our hope that that time has, has passed, that they're, you know, obviously not taking vacations during the school year either. Yeah. Uh, but they're planning that time around uh, summer. And, and, and again, two hours per day is, is not a lot of time. Uh, two hours a day, four days a week for two weeks. I mean, literally eight days times two hours, 16 hours. I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, the bridge, 120 students. We had like 2,000 freshmen. Could we expand that? Uh, was the attendance pretty decent with, with the bridge thing? Yeah, you know, our high schools, they've, I will, I will say, they've, that bridge program has been running for, for many years. Yeah, and yeah. They've, they've gone through different iterations, if you remember, to how we, at one point in time, we had expanded it to where we were looking at, um, we were increasing our AP course offerings, and then we tried to make that as part of the bridge program as well. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think the high schools at that point in time felt that we were getting away from the true nature of that bridge program because a lot of the, the students that are in that bridge program are direct referrals from yeah. the middle school. So um, the, the nice thing too, uh, or I should say the, the positive thing that is occurring is um, you, you have you know, less students who are finding themselves maybe in that position uh, of really needing that, that bridge support. Um, I know that their attendance continues to be strong. Um, that being said, I think part of it is just uh, linked to making sure that whatever number of students that are being referred, I know they're able to support them. They're yeah. not turning any students away. Um, if anything, they're trying to, once they hit their number, trying to make sure that, hey, we've got room for, for some more. Uh, what are some additional students who who, sh who can we can definitely uh, be a part of this as well? Yeah, I know it's been around for many years, and I, I remember uh, historically, and you don't have to tell me. I, I think we kind of focused on those DNF students who were kind of transitioning into high school. Um, but again, I think this is kind of one of those things where if it's not working over the summer, 
we try to figure out how to incorporate it into the day where they can have the more individualized instruction before they move on to the to their freshman year but I'm sure you guys are looking at that um, and then just the last one last comment slide three the funding I just wanted to touch on that again um, because all the things we've done with this ESSER funds and then people look at this and they're like whoa 9.3 million dollars that is a lot of money when you divide it into the number of students we have, it's $350 per student. The fact that we were able to do all this stuff for $350 per student, kudos to administration and our schools because, and our teachers, and um, because it's amazing what we did for $350 per student. So thank you. So thank you uh, for the um, update on the school, um, summer school plans and results. The um, question that Mr. Rising was asking about um, parents not wanting or not sending up for boost when they were recommended. Do we go back and ask them like what the issue is? Like, I don't think my kid needs it or I'm busy this summer or transportation could be a big thing and maybe we should consider some bu bus routes I don't know I'm just saying um, so I'm just curious to, did you get any feedback like yeah that? we're continuing to survey them uh -huh. on transportation we know is always one of the biggest things that come up so we, we've done our best to really make sure that that was not a barrier um, there's a consolidation of some routes uh, because we, we can't pick you up from every you know sometimes right in front of your house uh, all of that has to be uh, worked out with our de with our transportation department mm -hmm. if they're going to I boost do they get transportation yes they do oh yes. okay I thought they didn't yeah oh. yeah because again it's just yeah we want to try to remove as many barriers as we can yeah that's very frustrating I agree with mr. rising that that few agreed to send their kids to that program but hmm. interesting okay well thank you this was like a very comprehensive amount of programming and I really um, appreciate the fact that it addresses both the academic and the social emotional but also it addresses the connection to the district and the schools and I think that that's something very important to build in kids especially the ones that are maybe academically um, struggling um, to have them feel more connected to the schools. So thank you for putting the variety of programming together. If I could, just one off, one final thank you. There are a variety of people that make all of this work. Uh, Dr. Tara Bell, uh, with her work with grants, she makes sure as we, we don't miss a cent. Uh, Dawn Fork Forkner, Dawn Monkman, uh, Joan Peterson, uh, Dr. Barbie Chisholm, Dr. Mike Purcell, and our principals, they work so hard at this. Um, it's really important. Uh, it, in, in our summer program, it really is a village of, of administrators working hard behind the scenes to make sure that this works. Thank you. All right. Now we have legislative advocacy and Board of Education update. Does anyone have any items? No? Okay. I'm supposed to uh, just let the board know. Remember I told you how IESB put me on that committee to talk to ISBE, the State Board of Education. I guess there's another meeting coming up in January, so I don't know when yet, but I'll let you know and you know tell you what was discussed and everything else. All right, then I need a motion to adjourn and motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Everyone wants to happy Merry Christmas, happy holidays, yeah, happy New Year.